So in this <coughs> talk, I'm going to cover kind of when to use what and go through a number of things to talk about the Microsoft application stack and give my <coughs> personal opinion. Zuber has not paid me anything. He probably wishes he had when I give a couple of opinions. But for the most part, it's you know, my thoughts on where we stand with the platform. How do you choose what in the world to use? So real quick for who I am, I direct product management for the CenturyLink Public Infrastructure as a Service Cloud. <coughs> the Microsoft MVP for a few years, written a few books. Uh, I trade for Pluralsight, and I write for InfoQ, and occasionally accept speaking gigs from people like Sarah Bono. So the quick where are we to kind of set some groundwork. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote a book with a few other good looking fellows like Stephen Thomas. Uh, applied architecture patterns. And this was kind of different in the sense that it looked at how in the world are you looking at this whole set of technologies that Microsoft offers and choosing the right thing to do? So we looked at about 10 different technologies in general. This was about three years ago. Out of pure vanity purposes, who's possibly read that book? It makes me feel very special. <laughs> um, so I don't know what you would anticipate that since then that number has grown or gone down. You know, I look now and it's at least 14 where there's more technologies now for integration than there were for <coughs> So maybe you're not surprised by that. Maybe that's not something you, you would have expected. But either way, there's more stuff now than there was before. So funny enough, there's a second edition of this book underway, and I decided to be a technical reviewer for it. So hopefully we'll keep it accurate. But this is not a problem that's going away, right? I mean, so you probably feel a little angst if you're a consultant or you're a CIO looking at what technology to use. How am I supposed to choose this talk or WCF or cloud stuff or this or that? So hopefully we'll drill into a little bit of that here. So first off, what are the trends, at least my opinion, of what's changing integration? And why are we having more technologies? Why is integration different than it was five, 10 years ago? So the first really obvious one, if you haven't heard of cloud computing, it's out there, people like it. It's something that's changing how we think about infrastructure, right? The host doesn't really matter anymore. I can provision servers anywhere. I'm gonna tear them down whenever I want. It kind of changes your integration scenarios. I got cloud to cloud, cloud to ground, ground to cloud. My architecture is different. So the in introduction of the cloud's given me all sorts of new endpoints to integrate with if I'm an integration person. Just on-premise integration is not the future, right? There's going to be some mix, and maybe not right away. <coughs> You're going to integrate with SaaS applications, things sitting in public infrastructure. There's a trend of microservices, too, if you haven't heard the term. I think the folks at ThoughtWorks use this a lot. It's the idea of almost like SOA on steroids, but it's taking applications and services, sometimes very small, and splitting them up a lot, having a lot of individual services that you weave together later. So no more of these big monolithic whistles with a million operations and this and that. It's services, arguably, with different owners of each one. They version them. And so as an integrator, again, you have more integration points. It's probably more flexible now where you've got changing endpoints, changing payloads. So a very static integration tool is going to be tricky if you're integrating 30 microservices. And Netflix uses this architecture, and they have tons of services all targeting different clients, and then you weave all those together. And Azure and Amazon and others, they offer the same in the cloud, right? There's services for auto scale. There's services just for infrastructure, just for database. And so they've split this up into a lot of different things versus these big monolithic services. Well, kind of a lightweight integration thing. I won't call it, you know, ESB backlash, but there is a sense that, like, the big monolithic integration server is clearly not the right choice for everyone. Right? Cramming everything into a BizTalk or a Tibco or any of these classic pro providers isn't the right thing all the time. So it's lightweight stuff. It's simple messaging like RabbitMQ or queuing technologies. It's kind of rolling your own really simple stuff and saying, I don't want to either invest financially or complexity-wise in just <coughs> using a big, heavy integration box. So that kind of changes what technologies you might want to look at. There's different endpoints now. I mean, there's not just the, hey, I'm talking to a relational database anymore. A lot of companies are actively gutting their relational database portfolio and replacing it with NoSQL. Our company is. I mean, our platform, our cloud platform used to be 18 months ago SQL server based. We're trying every single month to remove that in our software sprint, so we're almost fully on couch, couch base. So moving purely to NoSQL because it's given us geo redundancy, it gives us HA, stuff that there's good reason for relational databases, but our integration technologies internally have to talk to NoSQL now, because I don't have any master data sitting in a relational database. So as we keep doing more integration, your endpoints are going to be different. It's not just the, I pick up a file and I drop to a database and I use FTP. That's going to always be there. Clearly, it's, you know, people are still running BizTalk 04, I'm sure, somewhere in this room. 
Show of hands for the embarrassed few. Awesome. Well done. See this. O2. Oh, that was worth a T-shirt. Uh, so, I mean, there's classic. Oh, nice. I mean, there's gonna always be those, you know, those nasty flat files, all that sort of stuff. But the the modern integration, the next gen integration, is going to be a lot of different endpoints. So they're sitting in the cloud. They are might be on premises, but don't just expect structured files. I mean. I gotta be honest, seeing an SSD for a JSON file maybe die a little inside. I mean, I, I mean, the wizard is nice, but that goes counter to everything about JSON. But you need a way to do it, right? I mean, you can't help it. But the future is not structured data in that sense. It's, it's about more flexible payloads. The, uh, if that's the tweet that goes out from this whole talk, I'm really upset about that a lot. Um, the last one I'll point out is automation. So the idea that Again, infrastructure, especially now, is the infrastructure is almost irrelevant, right? There's servers that live for an hour. There's infrastructure environments that live for a perf test and tear it down. And so automation is going to be the key. I mean, I need to be able to, at some point soon, guy over there, build fully unattended environments, right, in the BizFox sense. I mean, all these products, I have to be able to build from scripts. I have to be able to use tools like Chef, where I do configuration management. I have to be, that's the future of this, where You've heard the term, you know, you don't want the snowflake server where every server is special and precious and unique and you kind of patch and you upgrade it. That is not the future. The future is immutable servers where arguably you never update a server. When there's a new build, you get rid of that one and you build an entirely new one and that's the new build. You might do that every hour. I mean, that's again what a lot of companies are doing now. I think that's a really awesome way to think about it where you don't have that cruft of a box, which, which version is this running? Did I patch it right? There's never that case. A new change in anything means an entirely new server. And so if servers are immutable, you never touch them or update them. That's kind of the future of this. So do these products that I want to look at support that? Can I, on, by scratch, build a new environment for test purposes, for a dev, get rid of it, and so forth? So where do we want to be with all that angst of this change going on, there's new technology? You know, I would say where we want to be is that for every one of us, a simple integration platform, but something I can maintain, right? It can't be so simple that I can't solve the real problems. Just saying I'm gonna use nothing but MSMQ for all my integration is remarkably naive, right? That's not gonna work. But saying I'm gonna use BizTalk for everything, also not the right choice. So a as simple as you can be, right? That's gotta be the goal, but something that you can maintain long-term to actually fit your use cases. So how do we get there? So I'll pitch, I'll do three things. So we'll go through a decision framework, kind of how do you make some of these decisions. I'll go through my personal assessment of each of the technologies in the stack, and then we'll do a quick example that will either fail miserably because you won't actually answer any of my questions or it'll be spectacular. It's exciting, we'll see how that goes. For the first one, you know, when I wrote the uh, book with other people, that the point on the decision framework was I started trying to make this giant matrix where you could answer all these questions and then just end up magically at the right technology. That's impossible. A, because it would take a lot of work and I didn't feel like it, but more importantly, there's too many nuances. To that, right? I mean, there's what matters to your organization. There's other things that come into play where that's too simplistic and I wouldn't want to give you guys something like that. So the idea behind a decision framework is how do you look at a scenario for a project, for an organization, and pick the right technology? And so what are your sources, right? When you're trying to choose, or you're even thinking, what is my problem space really? Four sources for your, your different requirements. There's functional requirements, right? What's this system, application, whatever supposed to do. What's its functional purpose? Non-functional, these are typically your abilities, your secure ability, maintainability, you know, those sort of things that the user doesn't ask for that are kind of intrinsic in what you need to build to the system itself to deliver that function. Now some people argue that, sure, things like security, how can that be non-functional? Isn't that a functional part of your app? I don't care. It, it's classified that way. Who cares? Just answer those questions. That's all that really matters. There's derived requirements. These are the ones that you, you never like to hear as soon as the th your application goes live and someone uses it. I really expected it to do this. The hell was I supposed to know that? So it's kind of playing through those scenarios and deriving the requirements. They said I, they needed this. <laughs> Can I maybe say, oh, you probably actually need a data warehouse because you asked for data that goes three weeks back and I just threw it in some weird table and it doesn't work right now. So deriving requirements, it's okay to do that. Right? You can't expect that your business user has any sense of what you actually have to build to satisfy an application. <coughs> then there's the org strategy stuff. This is the stuff you usually can't change, right? Because some senior mustache at your company said you have to use relational databases. 
They haven't seen your mustache. And you can't help them. Yeah, you have no choice. You have to do that. So the organizational strategy does come into play. It's do you build versus buy, right? If you're a buy shop and you buy everything, saying I'm going to build my own service bus, just give me the money, that's insane, right? You're never going to get that through. So that has to come into play as you're figuring out what, what goes into this <coughs> as a capability. So I'm going to go through four dimensions of a decision framework. Your solution design, your solution development, operations, and your org strategy. And for each one of these, I want to call out a couple things. First, there's some things I put in the book. And I'm also going to include some things I think are more relevant now in the cloud space. So how is this evolving, right? That's not a fixed list. But these are the things you would ask yourself in each dimension when you're assessing the technologies. When I'm weighing WCF or ASP.NET Web API, or I'm choosing Stream Insight or something passing through WCF, whatever it is, when I'm choosing my technologies, arguably these would be the questions I would ask myself. So what are my data volumes, right? I mean, I'm sure there's people in this room, you can be ashamed, that you've tried to pass that five gig file through BizTalk because you're <coughs> writing an ETL process. Shame on you, it's not, that's not right, but I've probably tried that before. But you try to use the wrong tool, sometimes data volume's a big one, right? You've got giant data sets, and you've got a volume that maybe a persistent ESP tool is not the right choice. If I'm doing clickstream analysis on a website, and you tell me you're using BizTalk for that, I, that's going to be a short conversation. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> New with this. Um, guaranteed delivery, right? Sometimes this matters, sometimes it doesn't. You've got use cases where it's okay to lose data. And your first thought is, how is that right? right? There's data that comes through where, again, if I miss a stock ticker, who cares? Get another one in three seconds. Or there's certain information, it's okay if it's allowed to drop. And that might, again, help you decide what technology to use. What are my data sources? I mean, now this seems more relevant than ever, where where is my stuff at? And where does it have to go to? Because there's going to be some technologies that play really nicely with some endpoints and not with others. Right? I'm not going to try to use SSIS integration stuff probably with a lot of web services, because it's not natively connecting cleanly to web endpoints. It's great for data source to data source. So knowing those is going to help me pick my right thing. Latency, does it matter how long this thing takes from A to B through all the different steps? You know, this talk has a message box. That persistence is fantastic. You know, it's adding at least a few hundred milliseconds on your in and out path. Again, maybe that doesn't matter, but that's one reason it's not always a great idea to do request reply stuff through BizTalk if you don't have to, right? Do asynchronous wherever you can. Authentication, how sophisticated is it? We just, the guru was just talking about with the service bus stuff, you know, as you play through different authentication options now with service bus on premises, you know, what are your requirements for that? If you've got a really sophisticated need for a weird security protocol, you're gonna need something that probably has a lot of extensibility points versus this is the only way it works. You need that ESP portal-like experience where I'm writing things to some screen and I can change them and edit them. Or is it catch it and page an admin at some weird hour of the night? I mean, how good is that tool? Do you have to build any infrastructure or can you use something you already have? I guess like this, like 360, I should be touting the course ceremony. <laughs> That's the right choice. Um, the endpoint location. So the ones in blue are some things I think are a little more cloud relevant infrastructure in your service. I got a lot of different weird endpoints now, and I don't control them anymore. So I can't dictate terms on how does this SaaS application give me data, right? You give it to me in JSON, and you give me this data point. I, I can't yell and scream at you like I can sometimes with on-premises vendors. And then the reliability and constraints. I mean, you're going over, in some cases, an ocean to talk to some software as a service app. What happens if it's down? Does my app break? Is latency going to be a mess? And that comes into the idea of circuit breakers again. It's an old, still, concept that's good for a while. Of how do you make sure that you don't have cascading errors everywhere? And so now if I have microservices and I'm calling nine things in a row, if that third one fails, have I just hosed myself or do I have a nice fallback that pulls from a cache or fails over to something else? So I'm thinking about that more as I've got more distributed things, more chances for things to break. How am I purposely building an architecture or does the tool I buy have some way that I can gracefully fail over from one thing to the next? So developers, you know, as I'm picking a technology, I'm thinking about that developer, am I making their life miserable or awesome? I'm thinking about, are there any devs out there? I mean, that's a real constraint, right? I can say new technology is really sweet, I want to buy it, and there's four people who know it. Is that really the right choice? I mean, it may be, right? Maybe you're one of those four, and so you can demand a lot of money and be a gun for hire, and it's awesome. But there's a good chance there's not, right? So some of these really new technologies, like if anybody on their resume says there's an expert at service bus notification hubs, they're probably a liar, because you can't be, it's too early. 
So, you know, are they out there? Are the people you need available internally or externally for hire? What's the learning curve? Right? I mean, anybody who promises, you know, learn BizTalk in 24 hours, again, probably making things up. So you can't learn BizTalk in 24 hours. It takes like 2.4 years to actually learn. It. So, what's the curve, right? Do I have a people who are going to be capable of picking this up or not? And again, ask honest questions of yourself. What's the dev setup? Does it take four days for them to build a good dev setup in their desktop because they have 19 dependencies and some weird registry key? Or is it you know, a SaaS-based thing where they're just doing it all online? Understanding that dev setup, again, you might not be equipped for it. If everything requires a dev machine to run four VMs at once and you all have two gigs of RAM, do some quick math, that's gonna be terrible. So depending on what the dev setup is, if all your developers have lousy laptops, you're probably not choosing to run really sophisticated environments. <coughs> What's the IDE, what tools? I mean, you're, you look at the new cool tool and it requires a completely new dev environment that no one's used. Is that a real, gonna be an issue for you as you're choosing that? <coughs> Support system, I mean, some of these Microsoft technologies are fantastic for their community. I mean, look at this room. This is people who all understand and have passion for a technology. If you did the same meeting for you know, WF lovers, probably be a little smaller. Who loves <laughs> Windows workflow? It's not the same group of people. So, What's the support system? Do I have knowledge base articles? Do I have discussion groups? Do I have experts I can reach out to? The answer is no, you're incurring some risk, right? Because you know, as much as some of us love playing early adopter technology <coughs> stuff, anytime you plug in your error code into your favorite search engine, it's zero hits. That is a very sad, lonely feeling. <laughs> I experience it often. I hate that. What's second worst is when my own blog post comes up. <laughs> I didn't know it then. I don't know it now. It's visual. So, is there a good support system? Uh, automated build, and I talked about the automation story. If you're looking at tools that require you know, nine people in a row to kind of deploy and package and ship, that's not gonna be great for you if you're trying to move to a more DevOpsy automated environment. So now, looking at deploy to cloud stuff, the Azure's doing a nice job with Visual Studio of baking some more things into the IDE, so I don't want all this friction of I'm trying to push to a cloud and now I've got to save it or publish it, package it and upload it. That sucks, give me a right click push to cloud. You know, otherwise, you're making my life difficult. So that's gonna be one you're gonna look at for some of these tools is if I wanna run it in the cloud, are you making it easy for me to get it to the cloud? Web-based dev tools, some of these are pretty cool. I mean, there's Cloud9 IDE, there's Code Envy, there's some really cool cloud-based IDEs where I can do dev of, unfortunately not as much .NET yet, but doing Java, Node, Ruby, PHP apps, completely in a web-based browser, pushed to popular pl platforms and service providers, that's great, there's no dev set up there, right? I could be anywhere, I could be on my tablet, on my couch, writing code, which is pretty cool. Maybe, if you like that. Sort of thing. Uh, and then you look at continuous integration, continuous delivery, does it support not only the automated builds, but can I yank this stuff from source control and build it and publish it, constantly do it? I mean, again, hopefully the future is you're able to ship code on an hourly basis. It shouldn't be quarterly builds and complicated 78,000 tests to build stuff. That's tough, Boy, that's rough. Hopefully this stuff does become a lot faster. You can push this stuff in and the tools support that sort of thing. For the ops guys, the poor lonely ops guys, you want to give, make sure you give them some love. I mean, event logging, throw them a bone, at least <coughs> tell them what's going on. Does the product you're buying actually write things out that are significant. Do I use tools like <coughs> BizTalk360 to now listen on my event line? It's two plugs, each one costs you $100. <laughs> uh, performance tuning knobs, is that perf guy, you know, if you say performance is terrible, is their first response buy more hardware? Hopefully not. Is it, hey, there's a, there are weird registry keys that BizTalk now serves up for at least the admin console. How do you perf tune this thing? With, that doesn't require a full re-architecture. Or sometimes it does because the developer did a terrible job, but sometimes, right, you can actually flip some knobs and change IIS settings to do these things. Does the product I'm looking at let me do that sort of thing? Burst and failure handling, how does this thing gracefully respond to spikes in traffic and things like that? Is it gonna just shut down or does it, is it fine if I pass the terabyte file into SSIS? Does it complain or does it just kind of go slowly? Make sure you understand that. Backup restore. Sometimes important, you know, does it have that sort of stuff baked in? Are you rolling your own for that? <laughs> Scriptability, I don't think it's a real word. Spellcheck didn't like it, I'm using it. But can you script this thing, right? Does it have PowerShell commands?
environments? Does it have something where, again, you can use multiple things to build out environments or set up your environment? Does it have some sort of script hooks? <coughs> you know, I threw out the term again, the immutable servers. Does this support that sort of model where you could build this thing on the fly completely from scratch in under an hour? Hopefully, yes, where you know that you could instantly build servers for dev test problems, <coughs> you know, all that sort of stuff. Can you have an immutable server policy? Especially in the cloud, that's going to help, given that servers are more, you know, and some cloud providers where you know that it's running on very commodity hardware, there shouldn't be much affinity to an individual server. The whole point is scale out where I could be losing individual machines if I happen to. Does your application support that? That rapid release and rollback, we've all had the experience of a failed deployment. What does it mean to roll back from that? Does that mean another day of taking your system offline to roll something back? Or does this tool make it easy to push versions of things across? <coughs> Distributed deployments, how do I distribute, you know, if I've got a new cloud app that's sitting in nine data centers, have I made it easy to push it to multiple places, or is it going to be really complicated? So again, things you're going to deal with more in the cloud now that each one of you with a credit card can literally deploy software around the world for pennies on the dollar, which is amazing. It's something we couldn't have done before. Finally, the org strategy one, what are the things we're thinking about with organization strategy? So what's the long-term solution fit? How many of us have deployed an app that was only supposed to live for six weeks that's been in production for 12 years? <laughs> Most of them, right? Who says that? I don't know why we say that. But is it a good long-term fit, or is this just kind of a prototype level, right? Where it makes great sense to run it as a prototype, but you really shouldn't be keeping this thing alive for an entire generation. So is it that right fit? Vendor support, you know, obviously with open source, some of those questions become more interesting now, but is vendor support available? If you love having a wrote the choke, that's going to be really important for you. Does it use your existing investments? I mean, there's nothing more fun than having an ex a significant IT budget already allocated for software and saying, we now, you know, now want to buy this new, really cool, expensive thing. Does that work? Or does it make sense strategically sometimes to reuse what you have or use things that keep getting baked, baked into the OS, like things like service bus on premises and things where I'm getting this for free now. That, that's a big deal. Budget impact again, what is this gonna cost me? Luckily, you know, Microsoft's often the Kmart of software or Walmart of software where you're not paying through the nose. That's one of the value props where you're still getting great stuff but you're getting it at kind of a commodity price, but it's still not cheap, right? I mean, most of us aren't buying BizTalk itself to run for our friends and family. It's kind of expensive. <laughs> uh, build versus buy, again, this is really important. A lot of companies, I don't know, who's a build person at their company? Where you build everything. You the proud, look at you. The rest of you buy software like crazy people, and that's awesome. Risk tolerance, you know, we see this all the time, right? You walk, if you walk into a company and say, I'm interested in putting your app in the cloud, and you get any sort of sheer terror, that's probably a company with a high risk profile. I mean, if they don't like risk, they're gonna be a little cautious, that comes into play, right? If you wanna introduce a brand new technology, are they gonna be comfortable with that? Or is everyone gonna be really nervous and it's gonna take a lot more time to do everything? How fast can you bring it to market? There is no appetite, it seems like, anymore for the multi-year project in software, right? It's gotta be, I need value quickly. You're spending a lot of money. How am I getting this to market quickly? Some of the new stuff, I mean, it's impossible to ignore, even if you have Windows blinders on, that open source makes is a big deal. And it's a lot of things, even in the Windows space, where you're using open source products that don't have the traditional support profile or even the same release cycle. That's a fact of life. So is your company friendly to that? Or would they not look at any solution that has an open source license? And then commodity skill sets. As an organization, do they want to use technologies that they can find somebody off the street who can quickly code to this? Or are they fine with having a lot of specialists who know the thing, and if that person gets hit by a bus, they're completely hosed? You know, both are fine, but you have to understand what you're going to be able to tolerate. And then simple upgrades. You know, do, you, do you hate upgrade projects? Do you do them poorly? And I probably don't want to pick a product that has a really sophisticated upgrade cycle. I mean, Google mentioned it. The fact that BizTalk, you can run stuff from 10 years ago is ridiculous. It's really amazing, right? It's not terrible. That's, products don't do that, right? It seems like, I mean, you use certain things where there's a significant upgrade. You've got to uninstall, reinstall entirely. So BizTalk support for that is pretty fantastic. That's not common, so for a lot of companies, it's still disruptive to do a BizTalk upgrade. It's middleware, it touches a lot of things, but what is the company's tolerance for upgrades? And do you need to do things that are simpler, or can you handle complexity? All right, here's my uncomfortable product evaluation, at least for Microsoft employees. 
So this is my sense of what is the product, and then the what I recommend, me, buy, hold, or sell. If you were starting from scratch, all things being equal, would you buy this technology, no qualms? Would you hold, meaning, not bad, it might be the right fit for your situation, but I wouldn't universally say it's a great fit. And would I sell? Would I say, I don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole, it's a leper, it's bad technology. I don't think I rate it anything sell. Because that would, I, I, I thought of putting a fake sell slide in there for BizTalk just to terrify Guru, but that's not right, and I would never be invited back. So that's not the case. So first of all, you know, BizTalk, I'll start with the big daddy. You know, it's the classic tried and true integration bus. So each one, I kind of put just a simple, what's the tagline, right? Because if you're going back there, nobody is an expert on the entire integration stack. Again, if you say you are, you're making things up. Because there's too much out there, right? So I'm trying to tagline these things. If you were walking back to your company and saying, I need to know this product does this, obviously there's a lot more to it. But as you're thinking about classifying these in your mind, hopefully that helps. So obviously we know, all of us know what this is. I don't even think I have to drill into it. But you know, again, conceptually, you're using this for I chose, I tried to choose my words carefully. It's comprehensive application integration, right? It's sophisticated scenarios. It's needing that adapter model because I don't want to programmatically understand how to talk to Oracle or Siebel. You know, I want to make sure I can build things in a persistent engine that has things like identity and logging and all that stuff built in. Well, I don't want to build that stuff from scratch. Great fit. That is clearly not every integration scenario, right? Sometimes that's overkill. Sometimes it's not. Now, to everyone's hopeful happiness, I consider that a buy. I would, I would have given you a different answer three years ago. I, I think that uh, the team has continued to show more commitment in the last year, year and a half of where this product's going. Where I don't, I mean, I wrote that this thought dead post, which is still somehow the most popular thing on my blog. But <laughs> I no longer believe it's dying a slow, painful death. I think it's now doing what all mature products do, which is not upgrade at the same rate that it would, because it is remarkably disruptive to just. Eh, we're going to scrap the message box, who cares? You can't really do that anymore, although personally I wish that you would say you can draw a line in the sand and start over with things, because sometimes baggage sucks and you need to start <coughs> over. But nonetheless, unequivocally, for most scenarios, I would say this talking to your organization is a good choice. ESP Toolkit. So this is still the weird stepchild of BizTalk. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, say it's baked into the installation wizard and this sort of thing, but we all know. <laughs> ESP Toolkit lives in the basement. He is not <laughs> eating dinner with the rest of the family. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's fine, right? We all have that weird uncle who we still invite. <laughs> and he's the weird uncle. So, I mean, when am I using this? I'm using it when I have that dynamic messaging, right? I have extremely flexible endpoints where I don't necessarily know where things are going. I think it's really easy to use ESP Toolkit inappropriately because it's cool to use itineraries and then it makes no sense and I've made things more complex. So that's the tricky part, right? That this can be one of those shiny things where you say, oh, I've got services everywhere and I've got these on-ramps and I don't need endpoints for anything. It's all dynamic. And then what are you doing? That's really complicated and unnecessary. So I'm giving the strong hold kind of a buy, right? It's not the right fit in every case. If you're not doing really dynamic messaging, I don't think you need it. I think it's gonna be more trouble than it's worth. If you do have a very dynamic environment where I don't wanna fix my endpoints and I wanna kind of be very strategic about what data does when it comes into my system, it's a good choice. There's also not a giant skill repository in here. It's not the same, at least as regular BizTalk where pretty much every error code you've come up with has nine blog posts on it and seven wiki articles from Sevyon, so <laughs> you're probably in good shape. Not the same for the ESP toolkit. Windows Server at Fabric. So we all thought this was going to be something different like five years ago. And it's kind of just matured into the kind of comfortable little host for WCF and WF apps, right? If you're running WCF in your org, there's no reason not to be running this. It's free. It works great. You get different visibility. Same with WF. To actually have a real persistent host and not run out all doing our Hello World demos where it runs in the console. And that's terrible in real life. So a real host for WF is great. That's what you should be doing. Because I don't think this has any life beyond what it is right now, would I bet my entire company on it? No. I, I, I think it's all cl it's clear to see that this has kind of been a nice, comfortable maintenance mode, right? You're not going to see App Fabric V5 that changes the world. I, I think this is kind of 
run its course. And again, I can be corrected by any icy glares from the right, but <laughs> for the most part, right, this is a good product. This is not something where, again, I would, it's not going to change the world. Service bus for Windows. My opinion keeps changing on this. I think since some of the presentations this week, too. But this is one where it's pretty cool that I'm really doing on premises topics and queues now in a nice, stable engine. So I rated this a hold only because there's not a big ecosystem for this yet. Right? You're not going to find a lot of people who understand how to build the on premises version and maintain it. It's still relatively new. But I'm actually pretty bullish on this. I think that offering this is. I think Guru explained it perfectly. Having an actual persistence engine that sits next to BizHawk is an awesome complementary situation. And so being able to do <coughs> lightweight messaging right, with this, install this on premises, and you have a lot of integration scenarios you can now cover with simple topics and queues on premises. And I don't have to just do MSMQ, which isn't enough. And I don't have to necessarily roll a whole ESB. Not bad. So if you have a tolerance for risk, right, that's going to be this situation a little more. If you're cool with doing something that's a pretty new, not much of a community, it's on version 1.1, I think, it's, you know, this is pretty leading edge stuff, then you're fine. If you're kind of a dowdy old organization who's on BizHawk 06, this is crazy and flashy for you. You probably don't want to touch it. Workflow manager, I think uh, Sam's going to be talking about this a little bit, but, you know, it's on-premises, multi-tenant workflow stuff. Great for, I think it came out of SharePoint stuff. I mean, it's a good thing. I also rated this a hold. Mainly, again, there's even, I think, less public information about this. This is still kind of bleeding edge. It doesn't fit every scenario. But if you're doing a ton of workflow, OK, makes a decent choice. WCF, the over-engineered, over-configuration services plan, <coughs> which didn't fit as well in there. Obviously, it's nice. It's just it's funny when every release of WCF is about simpler WCF after the first one. Kind of told you the first release was super complicated. <laughs> config files were 10 times the length of your code. It's fine. It serves a great purpose, but it's kind of complicated, right? It, it does what it does, but, and I'll, I'll say bye. I must have been a great mood when I did this. Um, <laughs> there's a great ecosystem for it, right? I mean, people know what it is, but at the end of the day, it's, and it's obviously deeply integrated in BizTalk stuff. So if you just said, I'm writing off WCF, I'm burning all my t-shirts, you're kind of hosed in a lot of the ecosystem because a lot of things rely on it. So it's kind of necessary evil if I were giving it a less friendly term, right? You need to use it. It's kind of, I don't think it's a surprise. It's kind of end of, it's in maintenance mode, right? I don't think you're going to see massive upgrades or changes to WCF in the future. It's a mature product. There's not much they're going to do to it. I don't think you're going to see this light on fire. More like Web API. So something like Web API, if you're learning web services right now, this would be the thing I would learn. This is the future of web services at Microsoft. This is the REST-based modern web application framework. You're going to, I mean, hopefully you're going to have this hooking to the service bus soon. You know, you already have this off with some REST endpoints where you can kind of start stripping out needs for WCF. You still have the extensibility, but a lot more approachability than WCF. So this is the, hopefully, the tool for the future if you're looking at services. Windows Workflow or Workflow Services, I never know what to call it. But it's the long-running processes if you don't want to pay for BizTalk and you still need Workflow. It's... You know, I want to model out processes. I want to have some sophisticated flows. I want to even transform them like John showed, which that was pretty wild. You know, so it's a good platform if I want to do some workflow durable processing between my systems. What I call this? Eh, it's a soft buy. Right? It's also something you're probably not going to see massive innovation in in the future. It's probably another one of these. It's in a good, mature state. But it's not going to be something that is constantly, you know, .NET 5 and 5.5 aren't going to be adding a lot of stuff to this. I don't think. I think we're kind of done with this. So this, WCF, App Fabric, all mature, all kind of maintenance mode, if I were making my call. SSIS keeps plugging along. <laughs> this is if I need to bulk move data. Right? I've got a lot of data. I need to integrate my data stores. It's picking up a big file. I'm putting it in a database. I'm integrating them. There's a whole other other things that are families of SQL Server. Right? There's Service Broker. There's the Master Data Services sort of stuff. So SQL Server's got some nice integration tools if you got a SQL Server license, you can actually bake a number of good integration solutions off of it. Things like Service Broker are pretty cool. So definitely consider those. They make the right fit for a lot of these. This one pains me. Uh, so Stream Insight, complex event processing, processing. Arguably the coolest thing Microsoft has done in a few years, and yet I'm going to call it a hold because I don't think they're doing anything more with it. Personal opinion, they've been really quiet. I don't see anything new and interesting coming out from this team right now, so I would be cautious to invest any sort of big significant project on it. I can be 
wrong, but usually product teams don't go silent for a year and a half for good reasons. So I'm assuming this is kind of is what it is at the moment. It's very cool technology. It's something that's nothing else like what Microsoft has. I want to do, again, clickstream analysis. I want to do real in-memory BI, which is really what it is, and be responsive in event-driven architecture. That's awesome stuff. I taught a course on it. I've spoken about it. So that's why this one pains me. But I'm going to be realistic with you. I don't think that this is something I would bet my business on. Windows Azure VMs. So this is the BizTalk in the cloud, the BizTalk image, what we have up there right now. I think it's working right now. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, what did I call this? Oh, I call this soft five. Look at me. Uh, OK, I mean, it's for dev tests, right? There's no way I'm putting fraud here right now. I don't think it's set up for a fraud scenario the same way for data replication and all that. It's a good solution for dev test BizTalk in the cloud, right? Where else can you get BizTalk in 10 minutes? Uh, nowhere, right? It's impossible. So building it on your own machine, no. I mean, here, it's great to be able to do it. The tricky thing with this, and who spun up a BizTalk VM? Really? In the cloud. Not really, not on premise. In the cloud? Look at you guys. Wow. Destroying my arguments. No, right? the tricky thing with this, and you were asking, I think yesterday, as you look at adoption for this, whether it's even some blockers for this, I, for my personal opinion is, since an integration bus is about integrating things, having it in the cloud disconnected to on-premises, kind of a deal breaker, right? I mean, I have to set up the networking piece. I'd set up a site-to-site -site VPN through Azure. I would do other things. Just having the VM up there, what am I doing? I'm testing out some scenarios totally in the cloud, which is cool. But if I want to do true BizTalk development, I'm sure at most of your companies, I need to connect to on-premises assets. So I think this goes hand in hand with actually setting up a good networking story too. And if you do that, great solution for dev tests in the cloud. If you think you're just going to stand up a VM, eh, not, not as interesting. All right, service bus stuff. Service bus relay, again, not personal opinion. The service bus is the only unique novel thing in Windows Azure. Everything else, every other cloud has. There's nothing wrong with that. This is the only stuff where it seems like they're really breaking ground that for some reason not everybody else is tackling. And so the relay, being able to take on-premises services and share them without telling an ops person, is pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, okay. that's not very DevOpsy, okay. <laughs> you know, the fact that Cerebonne could build what he builds because you're exposing an on-premises endpoint for managed services, that's ridiculous stuff. That's amazing <laughs> that, you know, you can do trading partner management and then just expose your local system endpoint to the cloud in a matter of minutes and still do it really securely. Like, this isn't poking holes and now every hacker in the world can get it in your This is securely exposing services. So I am all aboard the service bus train. I think this is... Very mature now. You're seeing a lot of releases around stabilization of this. They've proven the volume. I mean, they were doing the Olympic stuff in Notification Hub. This is great stuff. This is something that I think plays for a lot of scenarios now. The brokered messaging really, you know, Relay came first. Brokered messaging is the topics and queues. Also, really got to be extremely mature stuff that takes a step beyond what an Amazon offers with their simple queue <coughs> service or others. This is advanced messaging in the cloud. It's not a replacement for a cloud message broker per se, but it's great for durable messaging between cloud endpoints. really solves a lot of problems. So get all aboard. I mean, that's not something I, I would hesitate at all to use on any project at this point. Notification hubs, I mean, this really solves a cool problem too. But I need to do mass broadcasts. I and mean, we wrote the uh, book I referenced earlier. Stephen Thomas is back there somewhere, right? He wrote a scenario of notifying a bunch of cable subscribers, if I recall correctly, about changes to their DVR. And of course, you know, reading that at the time, service bots, if I'm going to even send 2,000 messages through it on endpoints, it would go really slowly because it's sequential as it actually chews through them. There wasn't a technology yet to do mass broadcast. How do I actually send note to 1,000, 10,000, 10 million people? Notification Hub does that. So even if you have 10 users or you have 100,000, being able to push a message through with a really simple API and push it to mobile apps of every variety or a desktop app, that's really compelling stuff. You know, even if it's just simple notifications of, hey, an invoice is ready, and it's going to one person. It's a proactive push engine that plays with mobile devices. What's, what's not the love? So this one, I'll, I'll put a buy because I think it's great. It's also kind of new. So this is early adopter territory. You're not probably pushing <coughs> this in an org that's uncomfortable with cloud or cloud new stuff. <sighs> Scared about this one. This talk services. <laughs> Talked about a lot. 
Obviously, they're doing interesting stuff, right? This is lightweight cloud integration. This is a problem. This was a technology that you could solve cleanly with other Microsoft stuff today, right? Just topics and queues doesn't give me the same more sophisticated mapping. And why do we use BizTalk in the first place? I want a broker that can, you know, intermediate endpoints because I want to start with this and end with this. I want to transform formats and structures. So all that core principle, obviously, up here in the cloud. That's great. So having that there, we're really early which is why I'll rate it this way. It's a hold, right? Unless you're an extreme early adopter, it's just really GA really recently, this is probably a little risky for you. No one will freely admit that this is feature complete by any means, right? There's still a lot we're adding to this. The frequency cadence is great. You know, quarterly shipping is great. It's not done yet. You know, it doesn't do a lot of the things I think some of us might consider table stakes for an integration engine, but it's doing a lot of the core things, right? There's a foundation there. So this is one of those that you really should watch closely because this will or won't be a really <coughs> cool, important thing in the next five years, right? And you could veer off the road and it goes into a ditch and this ends up a dumpster fire or it ends up being a really cool foundational technology for the future of Microsoft Cloud. It's probably nothing in between. Dumpster fire, <laughs> awesome, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's the, uh, I mean, that's the challenge in front of them, right? I mean, for you guys to use this legitimately, and let's be honest, this isn't cheap. It's not free. So for me to use this and say, I'm going to invest in something that costs me money, and it's, you know, i got to be confident that it does all my <coughs> course there. I think that was the last <coughs> dangerous example. You know, there's a few things at this point, especially where I'm at. I'm not Microsoft only anymore. So as you're looking at multiple things, you know, there's some cool integration buses from SnapLogic and using RabbitMQ, using MuleSoft, using Informatica. There's a lot of awesome tools out there, which odds are, unless you're completely a Microsoft shop, you're looking at these. So be aware of more of what's out there because you're probably going to have to integrate with it. All right, good. So I want to do an example with you. Again, this will go poorly or well. Well, I wanted, you know, taking this in mind, right? Let's assume, I'm going to assume a scenario that takes into account a business requirement set a company profile, and you will or won't humor me with a couple of what I think the options would be for a solution. Because again, if you're a BizTalk person, everything looks like BizTalk. I know that. SSIS, if you're a SQL guy, you can solve everything with SQL. So it's interesting to think differently about those criteria of how would you rate this based on an individual scenario. So let's say we've got a fake company. I like coming up with fake company names and things. So let's say you're a loan qualification company there's something that exists. This is not novel. Don't go register this domain name and try to sell it back to me. I'm not going to buy it. But, you know, let's say you want to, I'm interested in a home loan. Go send it out to 10 providers and come back to me and stuff. Whatever. So, there's a business need, right? This is what happens when some business person comes into your meeting and says, this is what this thing has to do. They don't know technology. They're just saying this is the functional set of requirements. <coughs> so, you have to accept some loan parameters from some web customers, right? You need a web based app. You're going to accept some parameters. You're going to store some information in an on-prem system. You want to reliably provide some loan requests to a volatile list of external providers. Again, a lot of different providers. Let's say a lot of sketchy loan providers, so I'm constantly adding and dropping people. I don't want a lot of fixed endpoints because it, I might be dropping on a dime, making new partnerships and adding people, so I have to take that into account. And they're external. They're not going to be on-premises. I'm integrating with others. I need to be able to catch responses back, show the customer <coughs> which providers give them an answer. Was my last criteria. High uptime, low latency, right? I can't make this last three hours. It's got to be quick in all directions. So if we look at this company, strong development team, right? They've got a lot of good developers. They like to build their stuff. Their ops team's a bit overwhelmed. If there's any team, if any of you work with an ops team that doesn't say they're overwhelmed, I don't know. I think they even just say it, just because there's always a lot going on. But let's say in this case, really overburdened ops team. Decentralized, so a lot of different departments can do whatever they want. And what's up? What else? Microsoft friendly org. I have to throw that in there or else this whole thing doesn't work. <laughs> uh, you use RabbitMQ and mix it with, no, it defeats my whole example. So yeah, they're Microsoft friendly. They pay a lot of money every year for it, uh, service software assurance. So if we assume an order like this, right? And this is the scenario. I've got to do this kind of integration. I've got a customer website. I've got a database on premises. I've got everything. So I have a service bus. I've got a service framework. I've got ETL. I've got some named vendors. I've even got some ones that are going to be there in the future. And yeah, who knows? I might do something in the cloud. 
I'm going to roll the dice here. And if I ask for some thoughts on what are some ways you would do this, just knowing what you know at this point, what's an example of potentially a technology set that you might use to solve this? Drum roll, please. I have a crickets sound on my laptop. I like to play when no one answers things. <laughs> Thoughts? I mean, there's messaging scenarios, right? I mean, I could easily choose to say, yeah, it looks like this stuff. <coughs> I'm going to take a message in. I'm going to route it to a bunch of endpoints. I'm even going to do some tracking on a workflow and bring it back in with correlation. I'm going to send something back. It's viable. Right? I could build that. I could easily do the same thing with kind of an app fabric and workflow model where I take some things in and broadcast it out. Those are two choices. Uh, another choice could be I just want to drop it to a topic. And this is the example I built, so of course it sounds fantastic. I could drop it to a topic, and everybody who's interested, including my local system, just subscribes to it. And so I don't want to do any of the messaging myself. I want to drop it to a third party that's going to scale perfectly and all that stuff. I don't even want to use it on premises integration. Why not? Drop it to that. Now, how do you handle the push part? Right? Because if I drop it in a topic, and the other person's not listening to it, it kind of defeats the purpose. So you can also then mix that with notification hubs, because you treat these as different services, where in my web app, I push to a topic, I call a notification hub, and I'm done. Now I've broadcasted information, I've dropped it in a persistent message, and I've even consumed it from my on-premises system, and I'm good to go. The last option I would point out, which I guess is one I usually wouldn't think of until the end, was let's say all I do is notification hubs, and I have my database exposed via the Azure Service Bus Relay. I tell all my partners, there's a loan here for you. Call the service. And you call the service. Almost no moving parts, right? All I've got is all my existing systems. Now I've just tacked on a little endpoint to the cloud, added a call to notification hubs, and bam, I have an integration scenario. I can poke some holes in that. But as you said, I mean, there's really a spectrum at this point. Where I need the heavyweight ESB in some cases. I need to do all that routing and messaging. Honestly, I can solve this also by saying, I don't even want to move data around. You're going to come to my data now because I can use things like the relay to expose my systems as they lie in my transactional systems for you to query, even do updates if you're adding your record to your response. Could be some interesting ways to handle that. So I'll quick show you the relatively simple, but the example of just dropping this to a topic. Uh, so if we look at some of the code here, I mean, really, again, this isn't rocket science stuff. It's the idea <coughs> of I'm going to have something in the service bus, and I'm going to set up some hard to see things. I'm going to have a namespace. I'm going to have some topics. I can set up a notification hub. Again, this is really easy now. That again, we're getting really spoiled with how simple it is to provision remarkably complicated services under the covers. Using something like notification hubs and just creating one and being good to go is amazing. Coming into a topic and saying, Here's a topic for quote requests. I'm going to add a bunch of subscriptions to it. And imagine having internal subscriptions to an external message bus, which is really what you're doing. I can have my database pull from this, all my vendors pull from this, and I've just outsourced all of my integration. Sorry, BizTalk, sorry, SSIS. In that scenario, I might not need it. And maybe I still would want it if there's, you know, do I want to send the same data to every customer? Do I need to do mapping? So then all of a sudden, maybe I would even pass it through BizTalk services and say, for each customer, you know what, I'm going to hide sensitive stuff to the loan providers, but the internal database actually needs to know the customer's email address. I want to hide that for everybody else. So you're, again, you're going to see those reasons why there's cases to tack on these other services. But I guess as a rule of thumb, your architecture isn't perfect until you've taken everything possible away from it. It's not when you've added every feature in. It's when you've stripped everything out. So, your, for your goal should be, what is the simplest thing I can deploy that I can maintain? If it's anything more than that, you've done it wrong. And personally, I've done it wrong tons of times. You go back and go, that was, I built that to make myself look smart, not to make a maintainable solution. Like, there was no reason to build that crazy orchestration that called nine other orchestrations. That was just showing off. And now I have a terrible solution. So simplicity, right? Simplicity's key. So again, from a web perspective, calling these things is just so simple of being able to create a message of anything you want. In this case, you know, formatting an object for JSON, throwing, throwing it into asynchronously from the website, sending a message to the topic. Again, this is going to come back if it's, for some reason, the topic endpoints down. Of course, I have to have a circuit breaker, some way to handle that. It doesn't blow up my whole app. But simply sending something to a topic in one line of code is great. Doing notification hubs 
is really easy. You know, in this case, I'm going to send it to Windows Phone. I can send it to a Windows-specific environment, or Android, or iPhone, or I can even just do a generic template that goes to all of them. And that's also nice. So I can just do a simple toast message that they would all get. And simply send that. And again, to do this, I mean, I'm writing this code, and I can contact a million people. What? 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 I mean, nobody would have imagined that five years ago. So that's great. So I've got that, but then consuming it from, let's say, my database listener app, where all I want to have is a simple app that listens for messages and loads my database, all the new requests, this is really easy. I mean, again, I don't write production level code anymore. No one pays me to code. So would I really do a command line app with a loop? Probably not. But conceptually, all I'm doing is receiving a message over and over again and doing something. It's that easy to talk to topics. It's just really straightforward stuff. And building a nice, durable process that does it is great. And I've also written a Windows Phone app, which works 8% of the time, which I have no assumption this will work. But let's, uh, I'll blame it on the Wi-Fi here. That's the easiest way to get out of every demo today. So I mean, if I assume I have an app, let's, let's assume it's magically connecting to notification hubs right now. It has it all morning. So if it happens here, I'm going to maybe do something crazy. If I look at my web app, so I built just a simple web app that <laughs> You know, I'm going to use to send messages to all the different providers. Again, behind the scenes on this, when I'm clicking get quote, it's a couple lines of code to write to topics and send notification hubs. You know, that's my messaging solution. So I can just quick send something here. I'll do a quick proof. Nothing up my sleeves. There's no messages in the topic. I'm not faking it. Uh, my credit score is spectacular. Uh, the amount in Los Angeles will buy me a garage. <laughs> and this off over 15 years. <clears throat> Let's get some quotes. You know, quickly, this should come back after it talks to the service bus. Yep, we've just sent your loan to a bunch of providers. This won't pop up. I don't even know why I put it here. I'm just setting myself up for disappointment. <laughs> but <laughs> what I know will run is a little topic list. So this guy will run, and this should pull the message from the topic. I imagine it updates the internal database. I didn't even have to route it through a message bus. And sure enough, it quickly got my message. So, Building solutions this way versus your default behavior being saying, how do I route this through an engine and map and endpoints? This way, imagine it's getting new subscribers is the matter of creating a new subscription and giving that user permission on it. Bam, I have a new partner. There's no complicated exchange of things. I don't have to configure a send port. I don't have to do a map. So it just depends, right? If you have a really fixed set of providers, maybe that's fine. But in this case, that works really well. So obviously a really simple example, but just showing building those things is not complicated. You don't have to necessarily build those things. Some case times you do, but don't do it if you don't have to. So what's a conclusion? Lots of different tech. This is not changing. Almost you could argue that the integration services are being microserviced themselves, right? You have more <coughs> tools that all serve very specific purposes. And you're probably going to see more of that, not less. So we do this again in three years. That number will probably be 17 or something like that. The number of things out there are going to keep going. So how do you guys stay in touch with it? You know, make sure you keep doing things like this, which hopefully give you exposure to things you're not playing with every day at work. But keep an eye on these things, and then use a decision process for actually picking them. Right? I mean, choosing notification hubs in a scenario where you need a durable messaging component is a bad choice. Because if I miss the little pop-up, I'm done. I just miss my notification. I need something more persistent. So you know, I think you guys do this every day when you make choices. but. Thinking in terms of a decision framework of different criteria, in this case, solution design, development, operations, organization strategy, all that sort of thing, hopefully helps you make that.